Let me take you to 1 John chapter 4. Today we'll cover verses 7 through 16. And if you've ever done any teaching or you've studied the subject of teaching or communication, the greatest authorities in this field tell us that the best teachers use repetition in order to help their students get the most out of what they've learned. The best teachers use repetition to help their students get the most out of what they've learned. Okay, I wanted to make sure you're still with us. And I started thinking this through, and, and you know, over the years as I've studied the Old Testament, I see that God the Father uses repetition. He'll say the same thing in various ways so that his audience, his people, can learn and then respond. And then Jesus comes along in the Gospels. And as you look at Jesus, he says so many times the same things over and over and over, but he finds new and creative ways to be able to communicate those things. And some of the things we learn from Jesus is that in the early chapters of the gospel, he may teach something. And then in the middle chapters of the gospel, he goes a little bit deeper. And then as you get towards the end of his life, when he really wants kingdom principles to stick in the lives of believers, he goes really deep. Well, John, now as we get to chapter four, is going to speak to us about something that he has already spoke to us about twice before and he'll speak to us once again about this before we get out of the book of first john i thought you'd find it interesting to read what warren wearsby's comments are on this section i'll put them up on the screen warren wearsby says this about this section and john repeating himself for the third time he says does john repeat himself because he's run out of ideas to write about <laughs> you've been under the teaching of somebody who's run out of something to say but they don't stop talking warren wearsby says this he says no not at all what it means is that the holy spirit who inspired john presents the same subject once more, but from a deeper point of view. And John is gonna go deep today on this subject of loving one another. And since this is the third time that John has talked about it, and since what we're doing is today, we're looking at a deeper application of something we've already looked at, I thought we better take a minute and just review the two times before that John has talked about this. So grab your Bible, turn to 1 John 2, 9 that we could read a couple of verses together. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. I'll give you just a minute. John says this, he says, he who says he is in the light, and, and we study this, he who says that he knows God and walks according to God's word and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And I just want to summarize those verses with one simple sentence. John told us early in the study of 1 John that when we love God's children, it proves that we are experiencing intimate fellowship with God. And, and then jump ahead to 1 John 2.10 and then verse 14 also. I think I gave you the wrong reference. I think it's 3.10. Yep, 3.10 and 3.14. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Now, let's just summarize what John just said in one sentence like we did before. John says that when we love God's children, it proves that we ourselves are children of God. We spent two weeks talking about sonship, the doctrine of sonship, that, that in order to be able to really say to the world around you and to the church around you, I am a true child of God, you can't just speak those words. You have to prove it by obeying his word and by loving 
the brethren. So, so John is basically telling us it doesn't matter if we say we're a Christian. What matters is how we live our life. That, that's what proves that the Spirit of God is in us, is that we imitate God by loving people around us. And so that brings us to our message title for today. And we're calling today's message, Brotherly Love, the Undeniable Evidence of Knowing God. And I'd just like to ask you a question real quick. If someone walked up to you and said, listen, in one sentence, tell me what it means to be a Christian, one group within the church would go, well, it means you're good. You're a good person. And another person would come along and say, well, it means you're a religious person. And someone else would come along and have a definition and someone else would have a different. John comes along and he says, when we boil true Christianity down to one thing, John says, we prove that the love of God is in us by the way we love God's people. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So if you would, join me at chapter 4, verse 7. We'll read all the way to verse 16. And John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now that's a lot to cover in one Sunday morning, but a lot of what we'll be looking at today, we've already covered in the past, so we'll be able to just kind of touch on it and keep moving forward. So let me give you a quick overview of what we're going to look at today. John is going to begin here in verses 7 and 8, and he's going to give us the mandate to love one another. Think of the word mandate as a command. And then we're going to look at the manifestation of God's love in verse 9. We're going to look at the mystery of God's love in verse 10, and we're going to look at the mission of brotherly love in verses 11 through 16. So if you would, look with me at verses 7 through 8, and what John does here is he begins to set the tone for the message by addressing the believers that he was writing to as, notice chapter 4, verse 7, the first word there, beloved. John addresses you and I, as beloved. And in this context, we understand the word beloved to mean those who are loved by God or those who are the objects of God's love. Now, if we were to use the language of chapter 3, as we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks, John would be saying to us, beloved, I'm addressing you because you are the object of of God's love. You are the true children of God, as opposed to the world who don't know God, right? So if John is speaking to the church and he's using the word beloved, and he's saying, if you are the object of God's love, if you are the recipient of God's love, John is going to say, you have some responsibility. So I want you to do something again. I'm going to be very interactive today. Sitting right where you're at, I need you to make a decision. Are you a child of God? What is a child of God? We saw in the scriptures, a child of God is a person who has put their faith in the finished work of Jesus, Jesus' death, 
paid for your sins. You're trusting in that. You've turned from your sin. You've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. God's Spirit has come to live inside of you. You've been regenerated. You're a new creation. That's what it means to be a child of God. If that's you right now, just where you're at, acknowledge that. I want you to say, I I'm a child of God. Isn't that awesome? Now, maybe someone in the room is saying, I'm not yet a child of God, but, but I am a, and you could say, well, I'm a Presbyterian, or I'm a Baptist, I'm a Calvary Chapelite, I'm a Catholic, I'm whatever it is. The scriptures don't say that we become a child of God by a, an affiliation with a denomination, or even just saying, well, I'm a Christian. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm a good person. You may be here today, and all of your life you've said, I'm a Christian, but you're not a biblical Christian. I want to give you the invitation just at the beginning of our Bible study to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior so that the rest of the Bible study could be more powerful and more applicable. If you're here today and you're trusting in anything other than the finished work of Jesus Christ to bring to you righteousness so that you can be accepted in God's sight, you're trusting in something else, I have bad news for you, friend. You're trusting in something that is not going to get you into a relationship with God. You're trusting in something that is not going to save you. Just think of the most simple verse in the whole Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In order to have our sins forgiven, we have to put our faith in the finished work of Jesus. So if you're here today and you're saying, well, I, I never really heard it put that way, but now I understand it and it makes total sense to me, just take a second and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I was born a sinner, but I need forgiveness. And the only way I can have forgiveness is to trust in the finished work of Jesus. And then say, Lord, I was born spiritually dead. I need to be spiritually alive. Would you fill me with your spirit that I would be alive spiritually? And Lord, I repent of my sins. I want to turn from them and I want to have the power of your spirit to live for you. According to biblical standards, you just became a child of God if you did that. And I want to welcome you to the family of God. If you came in here today outside of the family and, and you just realized, wow, what Pastor Randy just said applies to me, you just joined the family of God. And I want to welcome you. And now I have some responsibilities for you now that you're in the family. My dad used to say, you want your allowance? Yeah, dad, okay, you got some chores. It's a little bit different, but God is saying through the Apostle John, now that you're a Christian, there are some things about being in God's family that are non-negotiables. And what John is going to do is he's going to give us this mandate and notice what it is. He said, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. John is simply saying, since you are a recipient of God's love, you now have a responsibility to reciprocate God's love. You receive God's love and then you turn around and you show God's love to God's people first, first and foremost, to the people of God. Now here's the thing is that you can go, well, hey man, I, I could love everybody. I mean, I'm kind of a, I'm a loving person to begin with. I'm a really loving person. Let me share with you that here in America and in the English language, we have one word for love, and we use it carelessly at best, right? Like for instance, I absolutely love Jesus, don't you? And I absolutely love Abbott's custard. I mean, it is off the charts good. It's beyond good. If you haven't been to Abbott's, you have to go. Get the chocolate almond. Get a double scoop, okay? You see, and, and then I could say, you know what else I love? I love motorcycles, and I love Taylor guitars, and um, I love this, that, and the other. And then you turn around and use the same word for I love Jesus, and in, in English, it just doesn't work that well. The Greeks had many, many words for love. The four most common, the ones that we understand when we're studying the Bible, there was eros, and it's a word that's used to express what we'll call an erotic love. Between a husband and wife, it's beautifully pure. Outside of the bonds of marriage, it's called lust, and it's sinful. We have the Greek word storge, and that's the love that's expressed to family members. Everybody will relate to this one, because you, you've got someone in your family 
think about this. Uncle Herbie is really weird, but he's my uncle, so I love him, right? That's storge. Then you got phileo. This is brotherly love, and this is where you say, I am committed to the members of the human race because I'm one of them and they're one of them. I'm committed, brotherly love, right? And then you've got the word that John uses, and he uses one or more forms of this 13 times in the 10 verses that we're studying today. It's the Greek word agapeo. And it's the verb form of the word agape. And it describes the manner in which God expresses his love to us. And I'll tell you a few things about agape and agapeo. This love is pure in motive. This love is others oriented. This love is not shown in order to receive something back. And most importantly, this, this is such a good one, agape is not based on the performance of the one receiving it. Do you ever feel like you don't deserve God's love because you've had a bad day and you're kind of scared to pray, you're scared to open your Bible, you're scared just to be a human being because you've had such a bad day and you think God's mad at you? He's not mad at you. God's love, God's agape, is not based on your performance or my performance. He doesn't love us better on Sundays because we were here singing to him. And worse on Friday nights because we've had a long day and we went home and kicked the cat. I don't suggest you do that, but God doesn't love you less. Your wife might be mad at you. I know mine would. But look at the mandate that John gives us. He says, let us agapeo one another. Let us love each other in action. Agapeo, verb form. And so often we think that God's command to us is that since he has loved us, we need to love him back. But that's not how God works. God says, this is what I want you to do. Because I have loved you, I want you to take your love for me and direct it to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want you to do it in this matter, manner. I want you to love other Christians practically. Agapeo is a verb, not a noun. And then God says, I want you to love them with pure motives, desiring that your act of love towards them would benefit them. <coughs> Excuse me. God says, I want you to love them regardless of whether they respond to you the way that you think they should respond to you. And I want you to love them regardless of whether they deserve it or not. Now you know why I feel like I failed a lot this week in preparing to teach this. <coughs> Excuse me. I have just failed over and over in loving in this manner. And why should we love this way? I want you to notice the second sentence of verse 7 and going into verse 8. Notice what he says. This is so important. He says, everyone who loves, everyone who agapeos is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. Look at what John says to us. He says, when one of my children abides in me, and when I abide in them, my love, John says, fills them up, and my love overflows to everybody around them. I heard the cutest story this week. A little girl came home from Sunday school and said, Mom, my Sunday school teacher lied to me today. And the mom said, that, that's a pretty bold statement. What, what did he say? She said, well, he said that God lives inside of me. She said, but I know God is much bigger than that. If God was inside of me, he would be sticking out all over. <laughs> and the mom said, he is, honey. It's his love that's sticking out of you and touching other people. Isn't that awesome? And that's what John just said. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. When you agapeo, it's because the agapeo of God is living inside of you. It's overflowing out of you and it's touching everybody you come into contact with. But John says something. He says, he who does not love, people who don't live this way, people who have what they call a Christian experience, but they're Christian grumps, and I was this way this week. I'm just, I'm just not going to play games with you. I was grumpy this week. And I, I think it's because the Lord was showing me, if you're going to teach this, I'm going to test you on it. I keep saying, Lord, let me teach on riches and prosperity. And I'll test me on that one, Lord. I'm good with that. But the Lord says, listen, when you are not actively loving the people around you, it's because you're not 
abiding in me. It's God, John isn't saying it's not because you're not saved. John is not saying people who are saved love, people who are unsaved don't love. No, John is saying that people who abide in Christ and Jesus is just flowing out of every pore and every corner of that person, those are the people that love. Other believers, they don't abide in Christ. They don't abide in the Lord. They get through life in their own strength and they love in the flesh and they, they do everything in a fleshly way. And then notice this last phrase. John says four simple words that clarify and then the rest of the Bible study is built on this. He says, for God is love. And I want you to ponder that for a minute. For God is love. If God lives inside of you, if God is abiding in you, if you are abiding in him, his character is going to continually rub off on you. And what people are going to say is that, you know, that guy, that girl used to be such a grump, used to be so much like Pastor Randy was this past week, you know. But as they keep talking about how they've been going to church and they've been reading their Bible and they've been praying and they keep having this weird thing called morning devotions, I don't even know what that is, or they're having what they call quiet time, I don't know, you know, but all of a sudden they're just so different. They're loving. Why? Because God is love. And when God is inside you and pouring out, what's going to pour out of you? Love. Amen? Amen. Now, John is going to go and he's going to kind of hit us with the question. And I'm going to create the question, but John's going to come through and you'll see what I'm talking about. Do you, right now, on this date, July 23rd, 2017, do you see the love of God just gushing out of every core of your being? Or are you a grump for Jesus? And you know what? We can all answer that and go, well, hey, I, I think I'm pretty loving. Okay, so turn to the significant person next to you who knows you and ask them, listen, does the love of God pour out of me or am I a grump for Jesus? And if they just kind of go, yeah, all right. And so I kind of anticipate that a bunch of people are sitting in their seat going, I'm not going to even ask anybody that because I kind of anticipate that. And so John is going to say to us right now, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of things that are going to help you build this kind of a life. And you can't fake it. And what he's going to do is he's going to say, I am going to show you two things about God our Father and about Jesus his Son that you can imitate and if you will imitate those things, you'll be able to answer this question and just say, the love of God is gushing out of me. And the first thing that John is going to show us is in verse 9, and we're going to call this the manifestation of love. Look at verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us. Now, I want to draw your attention to the word manifested. The word manifested in Greek means to make known what was once unknown, whether by word or or by deed. So let me just kind of draw a picture. Look back on all of history. And for all of history, mankind has known that God loved them because the prophets spoke about it. David wrote about it. But if you were to go up to a person, let's just say 200 years before Jesus uh, lived and say, hey, what do you know about the love of God? Well, I've heard about it. I've heard a lot about the love of God. How have you experienced it? Well, I mean, I, I guess he's covered my sin by the animal sacrifices. I, I think that's about all I know. Think about this. Then Jesus comes along, right? And what was once unknown, the love of God, is now made manifest. It's brought out from behind a veil and it's shown to us in a tangible way that people never knew before. H how did God take what was once unknown and make it known? Look at verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Now, I'm going to handle this a little bit differently than I've handled similar texts as we've been in other parts of 1 John. I've handled them very theologically. Today, I'm going to handle this one very practically. We've gone over the theology behind all this. We'll touch on it. But I want to talk about the practical, because that's what John is doing. John's saying, I want to teach you how to love by studying the one who is love. And three things we see in this text that help us understand God's love so we can imitate it. Look at these first three words, God has sent. This is what I want you to grasp here. John is trying to teach us that true love 
biblical love, godly love, is not static. Like, you know, you hear those stories of a woman who goes to talk to the counselor and she says, I don't think my husband loves me. Well, why would you say that? She says, because he never tells me he loves me, right? Well, why else? Because he never shows me that he loves me, right? Something like that. God is very different in that God has both spoken his love to us and God has made his love active in our life. He expresses his love through acts of selfless giving. That brings us to the second thing. Look at four words. After the first three, which are God has sent, the next four are his only begotten son. God expressed his love to you and I by giving his most valuable, I don't want to use the word possession. He, he gave what was most valuable to him. That was his son, Jesus. And this is why the last sentence that we might live through him. You see, we had a need that could be met no other way. And so God the Father says, I'm going to show my love by giving Jesus who will come and he will meet the need that you have. And I want to show you the need that was met when you turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And as you're turning there, I'll explain a little bit about this. God sent his only begotten son that we might live through him. And you may go, well, I've been alive since the day I was born, right? How many of you have been alive since the day you were born? This is a trick question. Put your hand down. Because Paul's about to prove that if you put your hand up, you was wrong. But you're going to be right in a minute. Look at Ephesians 2.1. Paul is speaking to believers in a church and he says to them, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works and the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Seven verses for Paul to say two things that I want to touch with you. First of all, he says, even though you were alive, you were dead. You were born physically alive, but you were born spiritually dead. All of us were. Why were we dead? Because of Adam and Eve and what they did in the garden, and they passed that sin down from generation to generation to generation, right down to us. And each of us were born and we had this need for life. We had this need for spiritual life. And John tells us that God sent his only begotten son that we might live through him. That when he died on the cross, he paid the price for our sin that we could experience instead of spiritual death, spiritual life. Now go back to 1 John. And John will go a little bit deeper. He's been talking to us about the manifestation of God's love taking God's love, which was once seemed to be hidden or veiled, and now it's been made known through the person of Jesus Christ. But now he talks about the mystery of God's love, verses 10 and 11. And this is going to be kind of humorous at the beginning, but serious as we go on. Notice, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is kind of funny. I'm going to try to make it funny. If it's not, please laugh because it's very fragile today after such a rough week, right? <laughs> There's no mystery behind why we love God. Think about why we love God. He is amazing. He's full of loving kindness and grace and mercy. He was willing to pay the ultimate price to buy us back from our sin. There is no mystery behind why we love God. Would you say amen? There is a huge mystery behind why God loves us. 
I mean, think about you for a minute. Let's get the focus off me. Let's think about you for a minute. Just go back over the last week of your life. If you were God and you looked at you, would you go, man, what a prize I got with that one? Or would you say, man, where's the receipt? Let's take it back. Right? Look at what God said, what John says here. Says, In this is love, not that we loved God. It's no mystery that we love God. He says the mystery is that he loved us. And then he says here this really deep theological term. He loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now we went deep into this idea of propitiation when we were back in chapter 2. But we'll talk about it a little bit more. Now, John, back in a couple of verses back, he showed us the love of God in that Jesus was sent from heaven to die on the cross to give us spiritual life. He goes a little bit deeper now. He gives us a second reason that, Je that Jesus died on the cross. The first, give us life, but the second, to be the propitiation for our sins. How many of you use the word propitiation on a regular basis? I don't even, right? when I get to it in the scriptures, but it is the most beautiful study. In order to understand propitiation, we have to know that it's a word that describes what God has done to make it possible for you and I to be forgiven. And let me go a little bit into this. God is just. If you study the scriptures, one of God's characteristics, one of the things that we know about God is that he is just. And what does that mean? Well, as you study the scriptures and you look at all of God's commands, you realize that every time you or I or any other human being that has ever or will ever live, anytime one of us breaks one of God's commands or omits doing what we should do, it's called a sin. And we know that every single sin that has ever been committed in the history of mankind is supposed to have a just recompense. I'll just give you an example. In the Old Testament, if a person committed adultery or murder, the just recompense was that they were to pay with their life. If they would kidnap somebody, they would pay with their life. Every sin had a just punishment. But see, God is also merciful. In other words, God has to be just, but he wants to forgive us. He wants to be merciful. So how can God be both just and merciful at the same time. Well, the answer describes propitiation, and it is the cross of Jesus Christ. For on the cross, God was justified. He was able to pay every sin's just recompense so that he is just, but we didn't pay it, Jesus did. Then, he's also merciful God wants to forgive sinners, and through the cross of Jesus, his mercy is revealed to us. Now you understand propitiation. You are a theologian now. God is just, but God is merciful. On the cross, God's justice was fulfilled while he showed mercy to you and I. Can you just stop for a minute? Can you say, thank you, Jesus? Can you say, thank you, Heavenly Father? What an amazing gift that none of us are ever held responsible for our sin if we put our faith in Jesus. Look up at the screen for a minute. Paul sums this up. One of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5.21. You probably see this verse on the screen at least once a month. I try to find places to put it in, even if it doesn't fit, because it is such a powerful verse. God the Father, that's He, made Him, that's Jesus. For God the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Powerful, powerful word this morning. God the Father makes his son become sin while he's on the cross, that you and I, who are summed up by sin, would be made righteous in Christ. What a beautiful, beautiful gift has been given to us. Now with that in mind, look at what John says in verse 11. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And I want you to look at the word so. Beloved, if God so loved us, since God loved us in this 
specific manner, we are to love others in this exact same manner. Well, what does that mean? Well, that leads us to verses 12 through 16, where we are going to talk about the mission of brotherly love. We were given the mandate to love. We're commanded to love. Because we've been loved by God, we are called to love like God. We were showed the manifestation of God's love, Jesus. Man, it's just blowing my mind, thinking about how amazing that is. And then we look at the mystery of God's love, that as we look at ourselves, he would even love us. And now we get to the mission of brotherly love. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. I, I want to stop right there. Just stop right there for a minute. Does that seem out of place to you? It's a Bible study on brotherly love. And all of a sudden, John just goes, no one has seen God at any time. Does it seem out of place? It really does to me. This verse seems so out of place. You're just thinking, John, what is going on? You're acting like James. <laughs> Have you read the book of James? James just goes from thought to thought to thought to thought to thought. ADD Bible authors. John is not that way. John is very methodical. So we have to figure out why in the world is John saying no one has seen God at any time. No one has seen the Father at any time. That's what John is saying. He's saying our Heavenly Father is a spiritual being, not a physical being. Therefore, earthly eyes, physical eyes, can never and have never seen him because eyes don't see spirits, right? Now, throughout the Old Testament, we see prophets and people who had visions of God, but they did not with their physical eyes ever see God. And then John comes along and he says this, just track with me. We're going to read all the way to the end of verse 16. He says, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. And by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen, notice that word seen, no one has ever seen God. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. We're going to take everything we just read and we're going to break it into three parts. John is kind of saying this, and picture him speaking to you. Pretend John is up here and not me. John would say to you, none of your brothers and sisters in Christ have ever seen God the Father, and no non-believer in the history of mankind has ever seen God the Father. And then he says, but because God abides in Christians, and because we abide in him, three things are going to happen. Check this out, what John says. He says, because the love of God is abiding in us, you and I, believers, we're going to find ourselves imitating God by loving others in a self-sacrificial way. We're going to see the evidence of God's Spirit working in our lives and through our lives. And in the process, we're going to be convinced that we're a genuine child of God. And so John says to us, we are going to see the evidence of God because we love other people. No one's ever seen God the Father, but when we love one another, we prove to ourselves that God exists, that he's in us. And then John goes on and he says, when one believer experiences selfless love coming from another believer, they see the perfection of God's love expressed to them in an undeniable way. They don't see God the Father with their eyes, but they see the evidence of God's love being expressed to them. And then one more thing. John says, when the non-believing world around you, the people at work, the people in your neighborhood, maybe some of your family members, when non-believers around you experience believers loving them in a selfless way, they come to the undeniable realization that God exists. And although they've never seen him with their eyes, they see him at work through Christians loving one another and through Christians loving them. I feel like I lost you guys. Are you with me? You guys tracking? Go like this if you're tracking. I'll start all over if I have to. And everyone's going. 
<laughs> just think about it. What John said in all of those sentences, I just, I just packed it down into application. The first is just simply this. When you as a believer love like God loves, selflessly, with an others focused goal, not requiring that the person deserve the love and, and you know, you love like that, you say, this is impossible for me. This can only be God loving through me. When another believer receives that kind of love, they go, that was God loving me through that person. God exists. A non-believer is loved by a Christian and they go, I have always doubted God, but I think I just had contact with him through this person that God sent to me. See, when, when God abides in a Christian, and that Christian abides in God, the result is always going to be love for others. You're going to love the Christians around you. You're going to love the non-believers around you, and it's going to have an evangelistic effect on the people who don't know the Lord. That's the mission of brotherly love. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. And it's interesting, we're looking at this going, wow, it's not rocket science, is it? It's me abiding in God, God abiding in me, and his love flowing through me. So we don't have to work so hard to love one another anymore. We just have to abide in the Lord and let him work through us. So here's our conclusion. We're going to look in a minute at the second half of verse 16. But John gave a mandate. He started in verses 7, 8, and he gave you and I a mandate. He says, this is what you and I are called to do. He says, Christian, you have been loved by God. And in turn, you should love one another. So I'm going to ask you a couple of application questions. If you're a believer here today, I want you to grade yourself on the manner in which you love the people around you. You know, just take like one to five or something like that and just say, I'm, I'm about a three. Well, if you're a three, you know, maybe if you abide in the Lord a little bit more this week, you just spend a little bit more time with Jesus, a little more time in the Word, a little bit more time in prayer, I bet next week you'd be able to say, I've kind of, I've been loving at a four. You know, and then maybe as you spend more time in the Word and, and more time in prayer and you're just really soaking in the Lord, next week after that you're going to say, I, I'm a 4.375. And I'm working my way, I'm, I'm, I'm actually realizing that it's not me working to love people, it's me spending time in God's presence and that just results in love. And so the next question, John gave us two examples of God's love and they both pointed us to Jesus and the cross. One, God showed his love by giving the absolute best he had that we could have life and second, he gave his only begotten son so that his justice and his mercy could both exist at the exact same time. Have you taken advantage of that? And then the last thing I want to ask you. John revealed that the threefold mission behind loving one another is that we would see God alive in us, that other believers would see God alive in us, and that the non-believing world would see God alive in us. What are they seeing? What's the world and the other believers seeing when they look at your life right now? And John concludes with a very, very powerful sentence. This is our takeaway. <clears throat> he says, God is love. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And John just summed up everything we've talked about today. God is love. And if we abide in love, it's because we're abiding in God and we see that God is abiding in us. So I'm just going to ask you to finish the morning by examining your life, by asking the Lord to show you, am I loving the way that Jesus has called me to love? Am I loving in response to what the Lord has done to me? And if so, praise God, because I need more examples of what to imitate, especially after this last week. But if not, if you're saying, you know, I, I love being a recipient of God's love, but I don't want to have to love people. People are hard to love. We're on to something there. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? People are hard to love by design so that we can't love them, so that we have to abide in the Lord in order that he can love them through us. And then we can say, I am loving. The Lord is doing it. Father, this morning, I thank you for John's words. They're challenging. They've, they're tough. But what I took away from this today, Lord, what I hope everybody is taking away from this 
is that we are commanded to love and we can't get around that. But that you equipped us to love by giving us the opportunity to abide in you and to have you abide in us. Lord, if we are not loving and we're not loving the way you loved, it's because we're not abiding in you and it, that's just the bottom line. We may be saved, but Lord, we're not spending time abiding in you, soaking in your presence, memorizing your word, worshiping you, praying. Father, those things are essential. And I pray today for anybody who's sitting in this room and, and like me, Lord, as they looked back over this last week, they realized this was not the best week of my life. We pray today, Lord, that you would show us that you are not mad at us. You're not even disappointed in us. But you are calling us to change it this week, to spend more time with you, to spend more time drawing near you that we could imitate you. And Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege spending time in your presence, spending time in your word, spending time in prayer and fellowship and study, that your character could be in us. And Father, there, there may be people in the room today, and as I was sharing the gospel early in the message, they were pondering and they were thinking about their own eternity, maybe their own mortality. And Lord, there might be people here and they're just realizing today is the day that you have appointed for them to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And you're stirring these people, Lord, and it's not a matter of guilt. It's that they're being overwhelmed by your love right now. They're realizing that even though they've worked hard to be far from you, even though they've chosen to live in rebellion to you, you gave Jesus to pay for their sin as an example of how much you love them. And I just pray, Lord, that any heart right now that's just overwhelmed with your love would be speaking to you and saying, Lord, you paid this wonderful price that I could be saved and I receive that free gift of eternal life. I turn from my sin and I ask, Lord, that you would save me, bring me into a deep and abiding relationship with yourself that I could truly be transformed and that I could love, that I could spend eternity with you and I could have power to overcome these sins that have continually plagued my life. Save me, Lord. Church, if there's anybody here and that's where you're at and you're saying, I, I'm dropping my pride, I'm calling out to the Lord today, I want to be saved, would you just pop your hand up that I can acknowledge you? I just want to know so I can pray for you. Maybe you came today and it was just music to your ears when I was speaking a moment ago about the fact that God's not mad at you if you failed. You've been feeling condemned for whatever reason. The Lord would say to you today, He hasn't come to condemn you. He's come to give you life and life more abundant. If you've just had a rough season, you're struggling, you're feeling like God's mad at you, just remember what the scripture says. It was while we were yet sinners that Christ died for the ungodly. And the Lord is just saying to you today, He loves you so much and He doesn't want you hindered by guilt and condemnation. He wants you to be bold and remember that the scripture teaches that because you're in Christ, God is well pleased with you. But maybe there's some things you need to turn away from. Just confess those right now. Just in your mind, don't say them out loud because we don't want the people next to you to think you're worse than you really are. But just say to the Lord, say, God, I've been involved in some things lately that are not pleasing to you. And they're hindering my walk. Father, please forgive me. Cleanse me. Set me free. 1 John 1. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're so thankful this morning, Lord. Your truth is so powerful. We just want to pray, Lord, that as we walk out of here today, we would depend upon the Holy Spirit to teach us to love, to prompt us to love, and that we would choose to love 
selflessly 24 hours a day, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for Jesus who died on that cross. And now, Lord, we're going to stand and we are going to rejoice and we are going to thank you because you do love us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 